One Maryland, One Book is a program that was designed by the Maryland Humanities Council. And they have this wonderful idea that we would have a shared culture that across the state of Maryland, many people would read one same book and be able to discuss it, to come together in schools, in community groups, in book clubs, and talk about this one book. And it has been a remarkable program. It is five years into its work. Um, the weather has held up um, the woman who runs that program, Andrea Lewis. Um, we, we did expect her to be in our audience, and she's not here, but she also is going to bring one of the board members. If they do, are you? Board member. Ah, is this Dr. Noe? Yes. Oh, thank you, Dr. Noe. I'm so pleased that you're here. And in case we have scientists in the room, Dr. Noe, in addition to being on the board of directors for Maryland Humanities Council, also works with the National Museum of Health and Medicine, what we used to call Walter Reed's Pathology uh, Museum. And she is the director there. And we're very honored to have you here this evening. Thank you for being here, Dr. Noe. So um, just real quickly, um, when we put together a program, it usually takes quite a few partners. And this event is actually um, across the state. They have one after another. Our college is sponsoring three. So we have one at each of our campuses. And so just to give you a sense for the folks here at Montgomery College who have been teaming with us, we have the Montgomery College Libraries, the Renaissance Scholars, the Paul Peck Humanities Institute, uh, the Montgomery College Peace and Justice Community, MC Books and More. And as you know, they're outside selling the book at a discounted rate. It is a glorious book, and it is um, it would be a lovely holiday gift if you're looking for one. Uh, Professor Don Avery, who teaches music at Rockville, is um, the person who has really teamed with us to train Laura Song, the cellist who will play for us tonight. We have the Cultural Arts Center and their crew who are here supporting us this evening, and Montgomery College Television and their crew. So thank you all uh, of you. I'm going to ask Sarah Fisher, who is the head librarian here at Tacoma Park, Silver Spring Campus to come up and give to you a very brief synopsis of the book, um, just to give you a sense. And come on up, Sarah. Um, you don't have to have read the book to enjoy tonight's program. This program does stand alone, but it is richer yet if you have um, an understanding of the storyline. And she'll give you a super short piece. And we will also read a brief piece to help you with that as well. Sarah? Thank you, Sarah. I would be remiss. <clears throat> if I didn't say that in addition to the copies for sale in the lobby, if you're a student with an assignment, there are copies available to be borrowed for the li from the library. This brilliant novel tells the story of three people trying to survive in a city torn by the fear of desperate times and of the sorrowing cellist who plays undaunted in their midst. One day a mortar shell landed on a bread line and killed 22 of his friends and neighbors as the cellist stood helpless watching in the window of his apartment. He vows to sit in the crater where the mortar fell and play Albinoni's adagio once a day for each of the victims. The adagio itself was reconstructed from a fragment, the remains of the only score destroyed in the firebombing of the Dresden Music Library in World War II. But the fact that it was rebuilt by another composer into something new and inspiring gives the cellist hope. Two of the other characters, Keenan, a young man with a family, and Dragan, an older man who remembers what Sarajevo was, must make their way through the dangerous streets, almost paralyzed by fear and the crushing realization that this was what life had become, that there will be no awakening or return to normalcy. Then there is Arrow, the assumed name of the deadly female sniper assigned to protect the cellist from those who seek to kill him as he plays his memorial to the victims. In this beautiful and unforgettable novel, Stephen Galloway has taken an extraordinary imaginative leap to create a story that speaks powerfully to the generosity of the human spirit and the dignity art can create in lives under unimaginable duress. I hope that the music you will hear will help you to feel the inspiration of that art and the address that we will be listening to will be able to convey some of the inhumanity of war and the solace that art can bring. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to read to you a short piece from the beginning of the book, and then we're going to have cellist Laura Song play for you two pieces that are from, uh, related to the book. Do we have Laura there? Okay. Stephen Galloway wrote this book, and just to give you a sense, he compressed a period that took about three years. The novel really only takes about a month, and so the stories are uh, really condensed and they overlay so it is not true uh, a true timeline but it makes for um, a very compelling read this is the very entry part of the book entitled the cellist it screamed downward splitting air and sky without effort a target expanded in size brought into focus by time and velocity there was a moment before impact that was the last instant of things as they were then the visible world exploded. In 1945, an Italian musicologist found four bars of a sonata's bass line in the remnants of the firebombed Dresden Music Library. He believed these notes were the work of the 17th century Venetian composer Tommaso Albinoni and spent the next 12 years reconstructing a larger piece from the charred manuscript fragment. The resulting composition known as Albinoni's Adagio, bears little resemblance to most of Albinoni's work and is considered fraudulent by most scholars. But even those who doubt its authenticity have difficult denying the Adagio's beauty. Nearly half a century later, it's this contradiction that appeals to the cellist, that something could be almost erased from existence in the landscape of a ruined city and then rebuilt until it is new and worthwhile gives him hope. A hope that now is limited, a limited number of things remaining for the besieged citizens of Sarajevo, and that, for many, dwindles each day. And so today, like every other day in recent memory, the cellist sits beside the window of his second floor apartment and plays until he feels his hope return. He rarely plays the adagio. Most days he he's able to feel the music rejuvenate him as simply as if he were filling a car with gasoline. But some days, this isn't the case. If, after several hours, this hope doesn't return, he will pause to gather himself, and then he and his cello will coax Albinoni's adagio out of the fire-bombed husk of Dresden and into the mortar-pocked, sniper-infested streets of Sarajevo. By the time the last few notes fade, his hope will be restored, but each time he's forced to resort to the adagio, it becomes harder, and he knows its effect is finite. There are only a certain number of adagios left in him, and he will not recklessly spend this precious currency. It wasn't always like this. Not long ago, the promise of a happy life seemed almost inviolable. Five years ago at his sister's wedding, he'd posed for a family photograph, his father's arm slung behind his neck, fingers grasping his shoulder. It was a firm grip, and to some it would have been painful. But to the cellist, it was the opposite. The fingers on his flesh told him that he was loved, that he had always been loved, and that the world was a place where above all else, the things that were good would find a way to burrow into you. Though he knew all of this then, he would give up nearly anything to be able to go back in time and slow down that moment if only so he could more clearly recall it now, he would very much like to feel his father's hand on his shoulder again. He can tell today won't be an adagio day. It has only been a half hour since he sat down beside the window, but already he feels a bit better. Outside, a line of people wait to buy bread. It's been over a week since the markets had any bread to buy, and he considers whether he might join them. Many of his friends and neighbors are in line. He decides against it, for now. There's still work to do. It screamed downward, splitting air and sky without effort. A target expanded in size, brought into focus by time and velocity. There was a moment before impact that was the last instant of things as they were. Then the visible world exploded. 
When the mortars destroyed the Sarajevo Opera Hall, the cellist felt as if he were inside the building, as if the bricks and glass that had once bound the structure together had been, become projectiles that sliced and pounded into him, shredding him beyond recognition. He was the principal cellist of the Sarajevo Symphony Orchestra. That was what he knew how to be. He made the idea of music an actuality. When he stepped on stage in his tuxedo, he was transformed into an instrument of deliverance. He gave to the people who came to listen what he loved most in the world. He was as solid as the vice of his father's hand. Now he doesn't care whether anyone hears him play or not. His tuxedo hangs in the closet untouched. The guns perched on the hills surrounding Sarajevo have dismantled him just as they have the opera hall, just as they have his family home in the night while his father and mother slept, just as they will eventually everything. The geography of the siege is simple. Sarajevo is a long ribbon of flat land surrounded on all sides by hills. The men on the hills control all the high ground and one peninsula of level ground in the middle of the city, Grabavaka. They fire bullets and mortars and tank shells and grenades into the rest of the city, which is being defended by one tank and small handheld weapons. The city is being destroyed. The cellist doesn't know what is about to happen. Initially, the impact of the shell won't even register. For a long time, he'll stand at his window and stare. Through the carnage and confusion, he'll notice a woman's handbag soaked in blood and sparkled with broken glass. He won't even be able to tell to whom it belongs. Then he'll look down and see he has dropped his bow on the floor. And somehow it will seem to him that there's a great connection between these two objects. He won't understand what the connection is, but the feeling that exists will compel him to undress, walk to the closet, and pull the dry cleaner's plastic from his tuxedo. He will stand at the window all night and all through the next day. Then at four o'clock in the afternoon, 24 hours after the mortar fell on his friends and neighbors while they waited to buy bread, he will bend down and pick up his bow. He will carry his cello and stool down the narrow flight of stairs to the empty street. The war will go on around him as he sits in the small crater left at the mortar's point of impact. He'll play Albinoni's Adagio. He'll do this every day for 22 days, a day for each person killed. Or at least he'll try. He won't be sure he will survive. He won't be sure he has enough adagios left. The cellist doesn't know any of this now. As he sits at his window in the sun and plays, he isn't yet aware, but it's already on its way. It screams downward, splitting air and sky without effort. A target expands in size, brought into focus by time and velocity. There is a moment before impact that is the last instant of things as they are. Then the visible world explodes. And if we can find our cellist, Laura Song, who works under the direction of Dawn Avery at Rockville campus, she will play for us two pieces. The first is a selection from The Cellist of Sarajevo by David Wilde. This is a contemporary piece that is just released last year, 2011. Following that, she will play a selection from Tommaso Albinoni's Adagio in G minor. Thank you, Laura.
wow might come to mind. Exquisite. I'd like to ask Dr. Nathan Zook to join us at the podium. Us, that's me and my multiple personalities. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Nathan Zook. He is Associate Professor of Political Science at our Rockville campus. He brings a wealth of personal and professional experience to this discussion. His dissertation was on the impact of human rights groups on US foreign policy. He has traveled extensively throughout the world to more than 30 countries, including several that have emerged from the former Yugoslavia. He coordinates the International Studies Program at our Rockville campus. And uh, I think you're in for a real treat. Welcome, Dr. Zuck. Thank you. It's good to be here. I think we already experienced a real treat with the cello music that was beautiful, very haunting, but yet providing hope, just like the song in the book that she was performing, just a very appropriate uh, series of selections there. The cello, I'll be talking about three different topics tonight. The first, the cello as the most human of musical instruments. Second, war as the least human of foreign policy instruments. And then third, I'll give you some of the context about Sarajevo and the, the Balkan struggle that took place in the early 1990s. The cello has the range of the human voice. It's called the most human of musical instruments, partly because it's of its range. It goes from the uh, highest range for the typical female singer to the lowest range of the typical male singer. And so it has the full range of humanity in, embodied within its strings. Uh, the, the double bass would go too low, the violin would go too high. The cello is just perfect for human voice. And so it resonates with us as humans because it sounds like us. And it's surprising we don't hear more of the uh, cello as a, as a solo instrument like we just heard tonight. Um, it's often viewed in orchestras, it's often viewed with other instruments, but it's a beautiful instrument on its own to, to think of as a, as a human, just like us. The cello is vulnerable, it is sensitive, it is worthy of respect, it has this range of connections to us. And so the cello, you might see a cello struggling down the street to carry their cello. But it's because it means so much to them. It's such a part of them. I appreciate the cello of all musical instruments. I did play the piano myself growing up, but I married a cellist. The love of my life plays the cello. Uh, she's in the back row here tonight. And uh, my wife, Faith, plays the cello for the Capital City Symphony on 8th Street in the Atlas Theater in Washington, D.C. And so I learned early on to respect her cello. Uh, in almost 10 years of marriage, I have yet to actually touch the cello. Now she claims it's not because she told me not to, but it's just because I am too worried about touching it myself. I'm not sure, I, I, I think I was warned early on, but uh, now she says I could touch it, but now I'm too afraid to touch it. It's worthy of respect. I have carried it for her when it is in the, uh, the big case, but I've not yet touched the actual instrument itself. Now Yo-Yo Ma, the famous cellist who played for President Obama's inauguration in 2009 discussed flying with his cello back when he was in his early 20s. He said a woman guard at the Houston airport wouldn't believe it, the cello, fit through the x-ray machine, so she opened it up and tapped the wood with her long fingernails. That's one of the few times I really lost my cool." End quote. So Yo-Yo Ma believes his cello is an embodiment of respect. And so I also want to emphasize the respect for, for cellos. Another aspect of the cello as the most human of musical instruments is that it is almost human size. It takes up a separate seat on an airplane. Uh, it needs to have a separate seat in a vehicle. We have a small car and it takes up more space than any of our children do. A cello is a human sized instrument. A cello has sensitivity. It is very sensitive to the cold. Uh, there are people who have created ice cellos, but our cello is made out of wood. My wife's cello is made out of wood. Uh, but when we travel on extended vacations, we always leave the house heated or cooled so the cello is comfortable. Even if we're away for three weeks at a time, we want to make sure it has enough air conditioning in the summer so it doesn't warp and enough uh, heat in the winter so it does not uh, splinter or crack. And so. It is also our most expensive possession. I calculated it in our house. Of all that we own, the cello is the most expensive possession. 
Thankfully, my wife, my, my mother-in-law bought it for my wife before I married her, so I didn't have to actually buy it myself, but now I try to protect it so I don't have to replace it. The cello is a very expensive, very fragile instrument. It is in need of support, just like humans. You've heard the old song, Lean On Me. That's about humans needing each other to lean on. But cellos need us, need humans to lean on. They need that support. When you play the cello, it is going to be played by resting on, on a human. So it is in need of support. Many cellists feel their cello is often also in need of affection. There are many uh, photos. If you Google images, if you Google uh, cello hug, you will find all kinds of cellists who hug their instrument and love to uh, show affection to the instrument, to feel that essence of the cello as a rather curvaceous instrument. It has the curves uh, to some degree of a human. To play the cello, you have to almost wrap your body around it. The legs have to kind of come around it. You, you reach around, almost embrace it to draw the bow across the strings. It is often seen, therefore, as almost a sensual, erotic, or an intimate object for affection. Partly this is because it is played by stroking. It is played by stroking, by pulling the bow gently across the, the uh, strings, as we heard a few minutes ago. It's not played by beating. It is not a percussion instrument. Unlike the drum or the piano, which are percussion instruments, you play by beating, or the piano, you, if you look at the inner workings of a piano, you will see that the, uh, the piano keys are attached to the mechanism in the back that will strike the strings. And so a piano also, although we think of it as part of a string instrument, is also a percussion instrument played by beating the strings as opposed to drawing, gently stroking uh, with, a, with a bow. So a cello is very human in that respect as well. I, I teased my wife that I should have married a, somebody who played the harmonica. It wouldn't take up so much space. much easier to carry as I struggle uh, going to our parking spot on 8th Street after a performance. But in, in truth, I am very proud of the cello and of my wife playing the cello. I think it is the most beautiful instrument. And I, uh, I think any sacrifice is worth it to, to carry it. But it does take a significant amount of, of uh, space and weight for a person to, to carry. There are smaller scale instruments for children, but even so, uh, the ratio to a child is still a rather large instrument. A cello as, as life size. You're not going to be marching to war carrying this enormous instrument. We hear... Uh, around the holidays about the little drummer boy, the song, the little drummer boy. A little boy going to war, perhaps carrying a, a drum, sort of vivid imagery of, of the American Revolution and Civil War. You don't see little cello boys uh, at the front lines carrying this enormous instrument. I've not seen the film myself, but apparently there's a Woody Allen film uh, where he is playing the cello on the front lines in a, in a war situation uh, in, the, in the band. And so he sits down, plays a cello, the band moves on, he jumps up, carries his cello with him, uh, keeps sitting down to play. It's a very bulky instrument. You don't see that as being symbolic of a wartime situation, unlike the drum. So a, a cello is at its essence a very human scale instrument. It's an instrument that, you can be pl uh, that can be played, as I mentioned, solo, but it can also be played in unison with other cellos. And so if you consider a a, uh, an orchestra that plays, that has a cello section, the first chair cellist will draw out the bowings or write out the bowings to standardize the bowings for each individual cellist. So the entire orchestra, or the entire uh, cello section will be playing, drawing the bows across at the same time. Now you can draw your bow this way across the string and that way across the string and make the exact same note. But the unison of getting your elbows in line is a very beautiful part of seeing a cello section in a symphony, these standardized bowings. And so just like humans can be individuals, we can also work together in harmony and in unison. And it looks much better when we are working together in harmony and in unison. Historically, wars tended to be fought more with a focus on the power to defeat. Lines of soldiers in rows, cavalries, ready to fight with their spears, or knights ready to fight with their spears, or uh, people chasing each other back and forth across trenches, but attacking other soldiers, attacking those who were not really considered innocent because they were also armored, or people who were uh, wearing, uh, uh, carrying weapons. And so the power to defeat was a major part of 
historic warfare. Does anybody know how many people died, how many civilians died at the Battle of Gettysburg? How many civilians, innocent civilians, died? Okay. After the battle was over, there were some unexploded shells, some farmers, some children. It's, uh, I haven't really seen clear stats on how many people died later. But during the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, one woman is believed is documented to have died. Jenny Wade was baking bread in a tiny stone house. You can still see the house, I believe, near the Gettysburg battlefield, not far from here. And uh, a bullet, I guess, came through her, her wooden door, her kitchen door. And so she did die. Uh, one civilian, from what I've understood, died at the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas, depending on which side of the river you live on. Uh, so these bloody, bloody Civil War battles here in the United States took place without much loss of civilian life. In fact, the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas, uh, it was sort of a treat for Washingtonians to go out on a day trip to watch the, the fireworks, the battle taking place in the distance. They go out in carriages and, uh, and so forth and you know, have a picnic while they watch the battle unfold uh, below them. And so there wasn't that a, a attack so much on a targeted civilian population. Later, with the advent of increased technology, you have the power to hurt being a much more prominent part of warfare. And of course, terrorism has, has happened throughout history. And uh, that would have, in many cases, targeted innocent civilians. But uh, warfare has definitely changed with the advent of the airplane, especially. You have the power to hurt. Now, World War II is where we really began to see the power to hurt civilians. And uh, many, many more civilians died than would have been necessary if it hadn't been for the, uh, the attacks. Now, of course, many of the civilians that died during the, uh, the um, World War II era were also killed during, in concentration camps, which would be separate from the technology that I'm describing. But there were carpet bombings of, of cities uh, through, through uh, airplane warfare. And of course, the atomic bomb that came later. And so the, this huge increase in civilian deaths was a very prominent part of the, uh, this changing nature of warfare, the power to hurt. If we look at instances such as the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam, uh, there have been issues of Iraqi civilians in the, in the more recent war there. There was a, a recent uh, soldier brought on charges for attacks against children in Afghanistan. And so there are, in many cases, situations of uh, soldiers setting fire to civilian dwellings and, and including innocent civilians in their, in their attacks. The Japanese army was famous for a massacre of Chinese civilians during World War II. Uh, so you have this this element of increased technology leads to increased civilian casualties and death. But that's not our only instrument of foreign policy. Of course, with the advent of, of the drone, we may see more of this civilian casualty without the, the uh, negative repercussions for the army that is going into, into battle or, or uh, targeting civilians. But there are other, other uh, types of instruments we have at our disposal. We could use economic sanctions, embargoes, for example. And I'm not a fan of, of all embargoes. Uh, embargoes can also hurt innocent civilians in terms of cutting off food and medicine supplies, uh, as has happened in, in various parts of the world throughout the past century especially. But uh, embargoes, sanctions can stop pretty quickly. Uh, it's a very flexible foreign policy, and it can stop relatively quickly. And you can also allow loopholes for food and medicine to get in. During the sanctions against Iraq between the first Persian Gulf War and the more recent war in Iraq, the United Nations allowed an oil for food program that Iraq could sell oil in exchange for food for their innocent civilian population. And so there have been attempts to uh, reduce the impact of sanctions, of economic embargoes to some degree. Uh, another another uh, option militaries or governments would have at their disposal would be assassination. I'm not advocating assassination, but you get your target, just like that hand-to-hand -hand combat. You, you know you got the right person as opposed to uh, the entire regime. You're getting maybe the, the dictator or something. It doesn't always work. Uh, I've not seen the, the uh, film, but there is a film that was circulated a few years ago on the 600 plus ways to try to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, exploding cigar boxes, poisoned um, scuba diving outfits and so forth. 
the U.S. still never succeeded at, at targeting, at uh, killing Fidel Castro. And he, he was able to sleep in a different place every night for a while to try to avoid assassination attempts. But assassination has worked in other situations to avoid full-scale warfare and you get the person that you're really trying to get. The, the foreign policy instrument I would advocate especially is diplomacy. Diplomacy should be the first resort, not the last resort. War doesn't have to be the last resort if you have tried other options first. I had a team, two teams of students recently that went with me to a conference in DC. It was the National Model United Nations Conference. We represented Cuba with the one team and Israel with the other team. And my students, uh, we met in the State Department first for our, our opening ceremonies and they really got excited about the idea of using diplomacy as a foreign policy strategy, strategy, whether they were representing Cuba, Israel, or in the heart of the State Department for the United States foreign policy, diplomacy can be a way to really get your goals accomplished. And you get to have negotiations and compromise, but it does involve compromise. It might involve some short-term sacrifices and, and a little more of a delay as you wait to get your goals accomplished. But long-term, you have created friends in what could have been formerly enemies. And so as you engage in this aspect of diplomacy, you have the element of um, war as being the least human of foreign policy instruments, whereas people leaning on each other through negotiation processes, uh, embracing each other as they sit down at a table and, and hash out a treaty. And some of those other aspects we looked at of the cello can take place in, in diplomacy. William Shakespeare had a quote that said, they that have the power to hurt and will do none, that do not do the things they must do show, who, moving among others, are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, and to temptation slow, they rightly do inherit heaven's graces. Peace, foreign policy, does not have to be, uh, peace as a foreign policy instrument does not have to be a weak strategy. It can be a very vibrant strategy, a cello uh, strategy of, a very statuesque, human-sized strategy of conducting foreign policy. To have the power to hurt and choosing not to do so. You may have seen the film probably about a decade ago now, um, The uh, Schindler's List, and Oscar Schindler, the character in there, visits one of the concentration camp leaders, one of the snipers, who is killing people in his concentration camp from his mansion's balcony. And Oscar Schindler approaches him and says, you know what, if you would be merciful to these individuals, you have their life in your grasp, that's power. But how much more power is it to grant them their life back and to be merciful to them and to allow them to live and to forgive them? And for a while, the guy feels rather puffed up because he could have people in his crosshairs and then he says, I pardon you. He lets them go. And so that is true power having the power to hurt and choosing not to do so. Mahatma Gandhi argued that India should build up its nuclear weapons and then lay them down as a sacrifice to the nations, as an example uh, to the nations. So negotiating from a position of strength. Many countries, including India today, have developed their foreign policy by building up the nuclear weapons. We don't have those who have necessarily laid them down unilaterally. Other people who have the power to hurt were the men in the hills described in the book, The Cellist of Sarajevo, as they surrounded what has been referred to as the Jerusalem of Europe, a city divided by ethnic and religious uh, distinctions. Sarajevo <clears throat> as a city was surrounded by hills, and these men in the hills were able to target intersections and squares and plazas and marketplaces and pick off people one by one. This was one of the largest sieges in world history, the longest since the battle of the siege of Leningrad. Over 11,000 days, almost four years, the siege resulted in over 11,000 people being killed. And the siege, imagine that you were one of those men in the hills. You had the choice whether or not to kill. Excuse me a second. <coughs> you had the choice whether or not to kill, and you chose to have that power and to not hurt somebody. That would be true power. One of the snipers in the book, Arrow, is told by her commanding officer she needs to, to kill. She needs to kill someone. 
and I don't want to ruin the book for you, but she has to make the decision. Does she kill them or does she not? She is one of the best shots they have, one of the best snipers they have. She would kill almost anybody she sets her crosshairs on. But she has to make the choice. Will she follow orders or will she hold that power and, and pardon that individual? The beginning of the, 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 the cellist of Sarajevo in real life was inspired by a breadline mortar attack in Sarajevo where 22 people were killed. And one day while waiting for line at a marketplace, uh, the siege had resulted in food shortages, water shortages, and so people began to wait in long lines to get bread. And 22 people were killed in a bloodbath. And the cellist of Sarajevo, the real cellist of Sarajevo, his name is Vedran Smilovich, decided to go out and sit down. And the book is described as he's sitting in a crater uh, where the, the mortars attacked. And he decides to go out for 22 days to remember the 22 victims. John Paul Lederich, in his book, The Moral Imagination, said that this is the story of an internationally renowned cellist who refused to leave Sarajevo during the genocide in Bosnia. According to his, his work, Smilovich said, filled with sorrow, I eventually fell asleep at dawn and was awakened by new explosions and the shouts of my neighbors who were carrying children and blankets to shelters. I went to the shelter myself and returned home after the shelling was over. I washed my face and hands, shaved, and without thinking, put on my white shirt, my black evening suit, and white bow tie, took my cello, and left home. Looking at the new ruins, I arrived at the place of the massacre. It was adorned with flowers, wreaths, and peace messages. There were posters on local shops saying who had been killed. On a nearby table was a silent book of condolences which people were signing. I opened my cello case and sat down, not knowing what I would play. Full of sadness and grief, I lifted my bow and began to make music. Now, one of the members in the audience in the novel, The Cellist of Sarajevo, talks about what he experienced when he gets there. He was a man who was on a mission to get water for his family. He had to travel across the city, pausing at intersections to wait to see if other people were killed. That way he would know whether there was a sniper in the hills targeting that particular intersection. If people got across, they thought it might be safe for him to get across, not knowing whether the sniper might still decide to wait and attack him. But as he decides to, to come, and listen on his way back, carrying his huge water jugs to his family, he comes across the cellist of Sarajevo. And he listens to the cellist. He thought it's a foolish gesture, a pointless exercise in futility to play your cello for 22 days. But then the cello music washes over him. The exact song that we just heard as the second number of today. None of this matters to Keenan anymore. He, met, he stares at the cellist and feels himself relax as the music seeps into him. He watches as the cellist's hair smooths itself out. His beard disappears. A dirty tuxedo becomes clean. Shoes polished bright as mirrors. Keenan hasn't heard the cellist's tune before, but he knows it anyway. It's notes familiar and full of pride. A young boy in a new coat holding his father's hand as he walks down a winter street. The building behind the cellist repairs itself. The scars of bullets and shrapnel are covered by plaster and pain, and windows reassemble, clarify, and sparkle as the sun reflects of glass. The cobblestones of the road set themselves straight. Around and people stand up taller. Their faces put on weight and color. Clothes gain lost thread, brighten, smooths out the wrinkles. This is all from having the beauty of art wash over him. And he begins to realize that war is not the essence of humanity. War is not the essence of what it means to be human. It is enjoying life, getting that instrument music seeping into his soul. Outside of Sarajevo, the war was no better. Civilians were imprisoned in concentration camps near Sarajevo in 1992. Thousands of civilians were tortured and killed there in 1992. Arrow, the sniper in the book, says she realizes that for no particular reason she stumbled into the core of what it is to be human. It's a rare gift to understand that your life is wondrous and that it won't last forever. But to, to experience that during warfare, you know during war your life won't last forever. But to experience the idea that it's still wondrous, it is a rare gift to have that, that life. These concentration camps were horrible. The book does not get into the politics of the situation. Who was to blame? I don't want to get into it too much either. It's a very controversial subject. The first book I ever read on the subject felt that the mainstream media was very much um, uh, in the wrong and who they were targeting, the Serbian population as, as the guilty party. 
uh, there were attacks on both sides. There were civilians killed on both sides. The Serbian, uh, the people have received most of the blame in international in the international sphere. Um, many of the concentration camps, uh, some believe, were run largely by civilians targeting Bosniaks. But there were three major groups. There were other groups as well living in the former Yugoslavia. Three major groups were there. Uh, you had the Croats, the Serbs, and, uh, three major groups that are um, of relevance for the book. The Croats, largely Catholic. The Serbs, largely uh, Orthodox Christian. And the Bosniaks were largely Muslim. In terms of ethnicity, they were all Slavic peoples. Uh, there really did not have to be an ethnic distinction between them. Historically, they were one. Historically, they were of one nation. In fact, historically, uh, being Slavic peoples, the, the term slave comes from, from their uh, ethnicity uh, of Slav. Um, because for many centuries, they had been forcibly enslaved, in many cases by uh, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Uh, many of them had been forcibly converted to, to various religions. They were of one, of one people group. They spoke the same language. If they were Bosnian, they called it Bosnian. If they were Serb, they called it Serbian. If they were Croat, they called it Croatian. But it was one actual language. And so they did not have to be this ethnic strife. In terms of religion, uh, they weren't really that devout of, of people overall. They had just gone through decades of Soviet-influenced uh, communist rule. And under Tito, uh, religion was pretty much squelched for the most part. So the generation that came about in the 1990s was not really familiar with their historical religious faith. Um, so religion doesn't seem to be the main dividing factor here. It was more of a fact that it was uh, almost outsiders telling them, you fit into this box, into this category, and therefore you will fight against the other, the them. After the war in Sarajevo, uh, Sarajevo was the site for the 1984 Olympic Games. The field where that took place became a, gra a grave site for thousands of victims of the siege. Sarajevo was an urban metropolitan area, 400,000 plus people, almost, uh, not quite, but almost the size of Washington, D.C. in population. A very educated population, a very um, progressive population. To some degree, the war in the Bosnian area took place. Uh, it was almost a divide between the rural and the urban areas. The urban areas, you were more used to living shoulder to shoulder with multicultural, multinational, um, a multinational population. The rural areas were not so accustomed to that. And so some of the nationalistic divide took place in the ur rural areas and then became translated into the urban areas. I did not get a chance to go to Sarajevo myself. I was there soon after the siege ended uh, in, in the region. I was studying abroad in Budapest, Hungary at the time. And as I was leaving the United States, a refugee couple came to the United States and they said, we hear you're going to Hungary. Can you please visit our family in the former Yugoslavia? This married couple, uh, he was Serb, she was Croat. They met in university in Belgrade. I did get to Belgrade to visit. Uh, but they could not go back to her hometown of Makarska in southern Croatia because of the conflict, because of their inter-ethnic uh, marriage. And so they asked if I would go to see how the family was doing. I did go to that town, that village in Croatia. And it was shocking that I could go as a total outsider. But they could not go because they had chosen to love each other and marry somebody outside of their ethnic religious persuasion. And that was sort of the essence. The, this this uh, this balkanization of the society took place to the shock and dismay of many people living in cities like Belgrade or Sarajevo or Zagreb who were used to living near people who were different from them. And all of a sudden they're told that now those people are now their enemies uh, because of a religious or ethnic or other uh, distinction. Arrow's commander, Arrow being the sniper, her commander tells her, quote, some in this city like to think that this war is more complicated than it really is. In case you are one of these people, I will tell you the reality of Sarajevo. There is us, and there is them. Everyone, and I mean everyone, falls into one of these two groups. I hope you know where you stand." End quote. The idea in a wartime situation is it becomes us versus them. And you may know as we talk, as humans, we talk about our countries as our countries. We talk about our troops, our military, and we, we identify ourselves with us and our and who our uh, troops are and so forth, forgetting that we are all one people, 
as, as a human race. And so we don't have to have those superficial uh, human constructed divide and divisions between us. I'm not necessarily trying to turn you all into uh, you know, peaceniks and that you have to all just hum and get along and you all you know, hold hands and you know, put peace signs on your cellos if you're cellos. I do want you to think though about what it means to be human. Arrow, the sniper, she's actually one of the defenders of Sarajevo. She was firing back towards the men in the hills. In the book, she's one of the good guys. Uh, the, the men in the hills are one of the bad guys. And um, the thing about the book that's so beautiful, I think, is that it translates to other, other contexts. I had individuals the other day when I gave this presentation at the Rockville campus who said, this sounds just like what's taking place in this particular country in West Africa. This sounds like just what took place in my home country uh, in this part of Central America. Arrow says, quote, the men on the hills didn't have to be murderers. The men in the city didn't have to lower themselves to fight back, to fight their attackers. Arrow knows she didn't have to be filled with hatred. The music demanded that she remember this. She also is listening to the chalice of Sarajevo. The music demands that she knows to a certainty that the world still held the capacity for goodness. The notes were proof of this. The design on the brochure, the flyers, the posters that were put out about this presentation are so beautiful. It shows the, the, the human element of what we enjoy as the flowers and the cello music, but also has the rifle reminding that there is that potential for conflict, potential for warfare. The cellist of Sarajevo moved on, he survived. He moved on to live in, in Ireland. There was some controversy between him and the author of the book, The Cellist of Sarajevo, because uh, was it based on him? Should he have received royalties too? Bit of a controversy there. But the idea is that the message gets across through the book, that this message can be translated to all cultures, all political contexts, not just the Jerusalem of, Sarai the Jerusalem of Europe, but also the um, Jerusalem of the Middle East, or maybe whatever country we're looking at, Syria, uh, Libya, Colombia. Peace is not just the absence of war. It's not just the absence of war. It's not just a, a weak need solution. Peace can be deep within the soul, according to Jean-Paul Lederach, who wrote The Moral Imagination, still standing in the face of the horrible senselessness of violence. As Lederach talks about the cellist of Sarajevo, he says, on one occasion, during a law in the shelling, a TV news reporter approached the cellist, seated in the square, and asked, aren't you crazy for playing music while they are shelling Sarajevo? Smilovich re responded, playing music is not crazy. Why don't you go ask those people if they are not crazy? shelling Sarajevo while I sit here playing my cello. My hope is that we will remember, remember the struggles, remember the conflicts, remember those who have died, but find creative ways, creative ways more creative than war to, to solve them. Thank you for your attendance and I'm open to any questions or comments from the audience.